Hi friends, it's Marie at Living Felt and today we have a very fun project for you. We're going to be wet felting over a resist to create a one of a kind artful felt vessel. We love this as a beginner wet felting project because you are going to learn how to wet felt over a resist. We're going to show you two different methods of layout so you can work with fine fibers like merino top or a wool batting. In this case, we'll be working with a stiffer berg shaft. We'll show you all the tips you need to know for wet felting over a resist to get a really nice vessel. We'll be working with some lovely embellishment fibers and we're also going to show you how to finish it for a beautiful final result. We will explore some, getting some different looks in your finished piece by how you cut the hole and even how you shape it in the final stages. This is a great primer project if you want to learn to make yourself your own wet felted hat, your own wet felted purse, a wet felted pair of slippers, or even a larger vessel. Starting with something like this is a great beginning. The supplies for this project are very simple. For our first vessel, we are going to be working with fine merino top, 19.5 micron in two colors. I'm using Midnight and Lagoon. And then I have a wonderful collection here of embellishment fibers. We'll be using space dyed bamboo top. We'll be using viscose. We'll use wool neps. We're gonna to toss in some sari silk waste. I even have a bit of blingy Angelina. I'll show you how to use that. And I have also brought a collection of yarns from my personal stash. These are our sari yarns. I have some pre-felts here, and then we're also going to use some sari silk fabrics. In this video, we're also going to show you how to work with our coarse fibers, the Bergschaft batting. So we'll show you how the layout is different with that, but we use the same embellishment fibers and fabrics in that vessel. For this project, we are using two ounces of wool in the base of the vessel and then our embellishment fibers. You can choose the colors and fibers yourself or you can grab one of our kits that comes complete with the wool you need, all the embellishment fibers, and even some silk fabrics. The kit includes four ounces of wool fiber in two colors, so you're gonna have lots of room to play. You can make two vessels of the same size, you can make them two-tone like we did, or you can make one in each solid color. So have fun with however you break that up. The tools we need for wet felting this are very simple. We're going to use a towel on our work surface, bubble wrap, a single sheet of plastic, and then we'll work with our mesh and a second sheet of plastic. Each of these pieces should just be bigger than your work. We'll use a resist. Mine is approximately eight and a quarter inches. If you get our kit, you can use the templates included to choose your own size. I'm using scissors to help cut my fiber, a bowl of room temperature water, a watering device such as a ball bross or sponge, our loved olive oil soap, and a dowel for rolling your project in. Make sure you have some extra towels on hand as well. If you're trying to decide which size resist to use, we decided to share, I used this eight and a quarter inch resist for this vessel, this vessel, and this vessel. All of these were made on this resist, and I used a larger resist for this one. So keep that in mind when you're making your choices. The first thing we like to do is divide our fiber equally. We're going to cover our resist completely in our darkest blue and then put our lighter blue on the outside. To make sure I have enough to apply to each side of the resist, I first separate the wool in half. So I have one ounce of light blue, one ounce of dark blue, divide those into equal halves. Set these aside so that you know you have your fiber for side one and side two. If you're working with batting, you're going to do the same thing. Use a kitchen scale if you have it. If not, eyeball it the best you can. In this project, we want to teach you how to create a strong, fine, smooth felt with these beautiful merino top fibers. So you'll notice that how we pull off the fiber really matters. Take a moment to divide the fiber down like we show you and pull off your tufts so that they're thin and even. We'd rather see you get four beautiful layers of fiber than two chunky unruly ones. This is gonna give you the best opportunity for your fibers to intermingle well and make a nice strong felt. 
We start with our resist on one sheet of the plastic and before I start pulling wool off, I like to divide the wool again into narrow, long strips. This is going to help you pull off your wool in even amounts and control it as you pull it off. You always want to pull off the wool evenly, so use your fingers and thumb to keep the wool nice and flat. Remove the twist as you go, and when you pull off, use the base of your palm to pull the fiber off and get nice even wisps, just like this. We are going to extend around the edge approximately one inch. So shingling is what this style of layout is called by gently overlapping the edges of each tuft of fiber that we lay down. We're going to create concentric rows towards the middle until this layer is evenly filled out about halfway or a third of the way down that fiber. When you get all the way around the circle, you can add a little bit more in the center. Each time you put down a layer, press your hand across the fiber and feel for any bare spots. If there's any thin areas or you can see you resist underneath, put a thin patch of wool to make it even. For our second layer, we are now going to lay the wool in a horizontal fashion. Starting at the top, lay fibers going Left to right, you'll see that we start with a length of fiber, then we overlap about 50% of the length of that fiber, and the next one repeating all the way to the edge. Cover the whole side of the resist with fibers laying horizontally, gently overlapping each piece. If you have extra fiber, fill it in the middle instead of the edges. The edges are going to get bulky from laying fibers around them and folding them over the sides. The third layer, the fibers will run north and south. Continue the shingling pattern with gentle overlaps. You'll notice sometimes that we flick the fiber so that the blunt edge is towards the edge and the fanned edge is towards the middle, and that is a good practice to learn to do. That'll keep the edges as even as possible. Our fourth layer, we will continue with our spoking wheel pattern of layout with the fibers radiating towards the center. This time, start just back from the edge, almost as if you're laying it right on the edge of the resist. I tend to put any excess fiber into the middle of the circle. Very often, this is where either the base of the vessel will be or the hole will be. And if that's the case, we don't want them weak. We want them nice and thick. Even if you end up moving your hole to one of the edges, the edges have the benefit of fiber overlapping from both sides. So I tend to find that the middles can be a little weak and this is a safe place to put your extra fiber. It's time to wet out. I like to dissolve my soap a little bit in the water before I get started. This soap is going to help us hold all of the fibers really close together and help our water penetrate. It also helps open up the scales so that the fibers will interlock better. We use our mesh over the top as a wetting device. If you don't have mesh, then check out our section on batting where we use only the plastic. You can wet out using the ball bras to sprinkle water over the middle, and you can also use a sponge. No matter what you use, you're going to want to press the soap and water in and the air out without disturbing the fibers underneath. So we're not rubbing at this point, we're just pressing the wool flat. We peel back the mesh because we only used this in this moment to help our fibers get wet and soapy and we replace it with our thin plastic sheeting. With our plastic in place, we flip the project over and now we have an opportunity to move our resist if our fibers are a little off center. So this is the only time you can do it. Pick it up and shift it if you want to. Now our objective is to get the fibers as tight around the resist as possible. I like to use the plastic to help me do this, and if that isn't working, then just use your hands. But all the fibers need to hug the resist very snugly. 
if they're sticking off the resist as part of your fold, then they're gonna felt to themselves. Remember the resist is here to help us create this open cavity in the middle and create a hollow vessel. So take your time here. With all of these fibers hugging our resist, now it's time to put on side B of our inner core color. Again, take your time to divide the fibers into long, narrow lengths. Follow the same layout pattern for your wool as we did on side A. Radial, north to south, left to right, and then radial again. Make sure to use all of your fiber and put any left over in the center, but you can save back a tiny pinch if you want for using in your design layer on the outside. Remember to feel for bare spots or thin spots at every stage so you patch in those areas now. Wet out side B just like you did side A, pressing water and soap in, air out, Flip your project over and snug those fibers against the resist again. This repeated creating of layers is really going to contribute to creating a nice, strong felt. Because we're working in thin layers, tiny little wrinkles in your fiber at this time are not a concern. They'll all work themselves out in the shrinkage process. As the fibers get closer and closer together, those wrinkles will go away. So just get a nice solid containment of your resist in your inner color, whatever that is. And now we're going to repeat the same process for our outer color, which for this project is more of a turquoise blue. This is just a suggestion, but you'll find it much easier to work in solid color layers when you're first getting started. For laying out the fiber on the outer layer of your vessel, follow the same pattern that we did on the insides, radial, north to south, left to right, and then radial. That's for side A. To check how much water you have in your project, you can press your finger down and the water should puddle a little bit and then retract in a matter of two seconds. What we don't want is a whole bunch of water on our bubble wrap. That would just be too soupy for working with fine fibers. So if your water retracts like ours, you're doing good. Flip your project over and now let's get all of those fibers wrapping around onto our project. Repeat the process on site B. And this is our final wrap of our wool base layer. So get everything nice and snug around the resist and just take a moment to work out any big wrinkles the best you can by drafting the fibers towards the center of the resist. But for the most part, it should all smooth down with a little bit of soap and a press of your plastic. With our resist completely covered in our solid wool, now it's time for our design layers. We're going to use a variety of fibers that we introduced to you in the beginning, and I just have a few tips for you. If you're going to be cutting your hole in the top, or if you know where you want your, you're going to be cutting your hole, think about that when you plan your design elements. You may not want to put fabric over wherever the hole will go. 
And if you're going to be making a round vessel, you might want the design layer to wrap around rather than applying it to this side and then that side because when we expand our shape, then this area will be very obvious and it'll look solid. So we're gonna just expand our design around the outside. And when you're using the fabric, if you've not already tested the particular pieces of fabric to see how they interact with your wool, um, then maybe don't extend them over the edge and if it feels very thick, you're uncertain about it, maybe go with a slightly smaller shape. I'll be using irregular shapes. And you can always put a little fiber right around the edges of that fabric to help bind it down. Uh, but the goal is that the fibers will travel up through the fabric and adhere, bind to that. So if you haven't tested the fabrics, just go lightly at first and use this as your test. This part of the process, I like to allow myself to be very free. I don't even think about it. I'm just going to get these fibers down, except we'll follow what I said, and that is we'll extend designs around the edge where it makes sense, and we'll avoid anything too chunky where I will be cutting the hole into my vessel. Neps are going to do better if you don't put them in huge clusters, and if you just allow that some are naturally going to fall off. You can trap them down with a little bit of wool, but honestly, I have great success not doing that. Sorry Silk Waste is this gnarled, tangled mess of threads from recycled saris, uh, which are Indian garments, and we just tease them out and stretch them out so that the wool fibers will migrate through them. Everything we're doing, we're trusting that the wool fibers underneath are going to travel, up and entangle around these. If there's anything you're unsure about, we can trim it with a little wool fiber on top. I like to be willy-nilly with my viscose. I love the sheen, so I basically just tear it all apart into this new matty mess and lay it down on top. It's going to create beautiful sheen and texture. And yes, you can overlap these bits have some bamboo top here. It's variegated. Uh, it's going to provide a little bit of different sheen, but it's a very close cousin, cousin to the viscose. So both lovely, lovely shine. And again, just extend those over the edge so that that design will travel. And you'll have a lot of freedom in the final shaping of your vessel. This is more viscose in a lovely leaf green. And this is a tiny bit of pre-felt. You can make your own pre-felts. There might be some in your kit. There's always a little uh, extra fun bits in our kits, but I'm not gonna just keep that perfect rectangle shape. I like to misshape it a little bit. Now I'm going to take my Angelina fiber and mix it with a little bit of my dark blue from the inside. So create your own little matty bat. If you use the Angelina fiber by itself in a big clump like this, it's going to sit on top in a big clump. But using the merino top or whatever fibers uh, in your vessel to help it integrate will give you a better chance for it to bind down into the project and you'll see how we finish that when we get to the end. Here I have a little piece of sari silk ribbon. I'm just cutting off the join from two pieces of ribbon and I'm gonna toss that in there and come what may. I don't mind when I'm laying out a vessel if some things work and some things don't. You can treat these like little test projects and get a lot of joy out of making them and then make decisions on a bigger project later based on what you learned. Wet out your design layer on this side and use your plastic to help it get all laying down, and then we're going to flip it over and finish our design on the bottom. Stretch over whatever fibers you have without pulling tension. Just guide them over. Don't pull anything too tight because it'll sort of bind your wool. And add any final embellishments to this side. We embellished this vessel with viscose, bamboo top, yarns, sari silks, wool neps, and sari silk waist, plus we added a little bit of Angelina. We're going to wet out this side 
And then if anything is sticking over, when we flip it back to side A, just get everything laying down on that side so that it's hugging around the project. We have finished our base layout and our design layer layout, so it's time to get felting. So we've looked at how to lay out using merino top or fine fibers. Let's look at working with batting. We're going to lay out this project with bergschaft, which is a semi-coarse fiber. You could also use merino short fiber, but this is good for a nice stiff vessel. And it's not always even, not in how it comes out of the package or how it comes to us in pounds and pounds. So we are going to take advantage of the bat shape and be able to lay it down in these big layers, but we also want to fill in any bare spots just like we do on our fine layout. I start with the bat down on my work surface and I'm going to tear it off so that it's just around the edge of the resist about an inch or an inch and a half. Then I'll get my resist under the fiber just like we did before and notice bare spots. This is where I'm going to patch in additional fiber so that I have a nice even layer. I just do this right on top of the bat. We just put our hand down and peel it off or you can tear it off with your hand. Just press your hand all around the layer and make sure it feels nice and even. Again, we can have it a little more thick in the middle than we do on the very edges. So this process will be a repeat. We wet out side A with soap and water, flatten it. We'll fold all the edges around to the second side, moving our resist if we need to, to get it nice and centered. Once we have the resist covered in our inner color of fiber, we'll repeat the same process on the outer layers. One thing you'll notice if you're working with a more coarse fiber, and this is a coarser, crimpier fiber than the merino top, is I do notice that it does well with a little more soap to help sort of stick all the fibers together. You might also find that you use a little more water, but you don't need to keep all that water in the project. It's kind of like passing water through a dry plant. You need to pass through more water than you're asking the plant to retain. And I find that also with these more coarse fibers. So use more soap than you might with fine fibers. And if you need a little more water, use it, but just take it up so that it's not creating a big puddle on your work surface. The other thing to note in this example is we're wetting out with our plastic instead of our mesh, and we wanted to demonstrate if you happen to not have the mesh, uh, which you can get even in our starter kit, which is perfect for this project, is you can use your plastic to disperse the water as well. I do prefer to work with the mesh because it gives you a good feeling for how everything is doing, and I feel that working with the sponge and the mesh helps me use just the right amount of water. Note that on this final layer of fiber for the outer color only, the fibers are all laid out so that they're on that side and not wrapping around the edge. That's because the edges have gotten quite bulky with this fluffy batting. If you have any thin spots, well then by all means fill them in so that you don't have any thin areas on your edges. That's very important. In working with our more coarse batting, we very much emulated the same design concepts that we used in our fine vessel. However, the fabrics were untested with this batting, so my encouragement is to create a wider perimeter of fine fibers or the fibers in your vessel or the pre-felt used in your vessel to trim out any fabrics that you choose to use. The fabrics wanted to scoot off of this wool a little more readily and were a little more difficult to bind when the weave was tighter. So add a little 
little bit of extra wool. If you have, you know, hankies or some other embellishment fibers, you can also try those over the top and they'll act as little staples, binding the fabric to the fiber below. Otherwise, the design layout is very much the same. Now it's time to wet felt our project. If you've chosen to work with the fine fibers, you might find that things felt a little more quickly than those friends who are working with the more coarse fibers. They're both gonna make beautiful projects, so if you're working with something more coarse, your patience will be worthwhile because it's gonna create a nice stiff felt. The felting process is mostly the same. If you're working with the more coarse fibers, you might find that a little more handwork is needed and check for any dry areas as we go along. If things look dry and like the fibers are separating, add uh, more soap to your project so it kind of helps tack everything down. The closer the fibers are together while we're agitating, the more likely they can entangle. Stage one of wet felting our project is always handwork. We are going to rub around the edges, always coaxing the fibers to hug towards the resist. And any work we do rubbing on side A or side B will be gentle. Our goal is to form a skin and get all of these surface fibers starting to migrate together and entangle. We don't use any real pressure until we get further along in the project. This is like making dough or making clay where you're getting just the outside area to join together first. So be patient here, be gentle, and make sure that you're rubbing the edges of the project as well as side A and side B. You'll notice also that we do not have a huge puddle of water. You don't need it, especially with these fine fibers. So if there's a whole bunch of water in your bubble, wrap, then just take it up now. You're going to do this handwork for at least 10 or 15 minutes, but if your project is thicker than the one we've laid out, or if you're working with a more coarse fiber like the Bergschaft or the Maori, then you'll find benefit from spending a little more time, such as 10 to 15 minutes per side, before we move on to the next phase. After our initial hand working of our vessel, getting everything to form a nice skin and start to hug the resist snugly, I like to move on to rolling. Now we're going to continue felting, but this time we're gonna introduce our dowel. And to use our dowel, I like to kind of put it towards the edge of my bubble wrap and roll it up and then roll it onto your piece. Don't squish it too hard at this point. Plenty of water is going to come out, um, but we're just gonna start training it to getting this action. So we're going to roll it in this direction a hundred times, and then we will turn our piece a quarter turn for 100 rolls, a quarter turn for 100 rolls, and a quarter turn for 100, 100 rolls. We'll flip it over and repeat. So this is what that looks like. There's no need to roll it too tightly in the beginning. Allow the fiber to get closer together first and just get a nice round roll. Before I do my first quarter turn, I just want to show you that you can see, if you look closely, that the piece has already shrunk somewhat in this direction, but the wool has also smooshed out in this direction. The fiber will shrink in the direction it's agitated, and in this case, rolled, also in the direction it's laid, which is why we varied the layout like we did but you want to treat all edges of your piece the same and both sides the same. So our method is to do what we call gentle rock and rolls in short increments like this. We roll it up. We will do 25 rock and rolls like I showed you. 
This is a rock and roll. And after 25 rock and rolls, we give it a quarter turn on its axis so that a different part of the project is now sitting on the table. Making these little adjustments will help ensure that your project shrieks equally from all directions and all sides. Once we finish this initial sequence of rolling, we'll have rolled our project 800 times in total, 400 times from side A and side B. It's important to treat our object equally on both sides and from all four of those points so that it shrinks evenly. Our project is going to shrink based on how we laid out the fiber, the types of embellishments that we used, and how we agitate it. After rolling our project 800 times, I could see that this one piece of silk was not binding to the fiber down below. Pesky little thing, but I didn't test it first. So I took some pieces of fine fiber and or you can use the pre-felt and I trimmed all around the edge again. Trust me, after just 800 rolls, our project is not finished and there just may be time to get it to bind down. So add extra fiber around the edges add some extra soap and water, and then we're going to kind of tap it into place, mash it down, rub it a little bit, but gently, don't be too aggressive. We don't want it to felt to itself. We want to allow it time to migrate and travel into the fibers below. So fear not, if it still doesn't stick, you can stitch it down later, no problem. So with everything feeling like we're headed in the right direction, I like to remove my bottom layer of plastic, put my top layer of plastic back in place, and I'm going to do a little more handwork on both sides. Things are holding together pretty well. We've done a little patch on our silk fabric, and now we're going to actually continue the agitation in the very same way, but we're going to increase our pressure. So continue, go around your whole piece and do another 100 rolls from each axis, both sides, increase your speed a little bit and your downwards pressure as you roll. Make sure that your roll is always round by tucking your towel underneath and keep it round as you roll. We have rolled this another 100 times on this side and you can see that it's really starting to shrink up because it's starting to bow on the resist. But just be patient, flip it over and continue your 100 rolls and then we'll check it about removing. So keep rolling from all four points, north, south, east and west. Here is a nice up close look at our project. You can see we're getting some nice little wrinklies in here. Our elements are staying down. Some of them will probably come loose like a few neps. I always plan to lose a few neps. This Angelina is, you know, is always going to sit a little on top, which is why we integrated wool fiber into it. This silk is looking pretty okay. And then underneath, I'm thinking our patch is probably gonna hold under here. So the whole piece is kind of holding together. And what we want is for it to feel like one piece of fabric. I can tell you that what you're seeing here is the resist underneath buckling, which is a great sign. The fibers have shrunk more than the initial size of the resist, so it's gonna look a little curled when we take them out. What we wanna do is make sure that this feels like one piece of fabric as opposed to layers of fabric. So when you have a resist like this, we kind of pull and notice, are the, does this feel like one piece of fabric or are the design elements just pulling away? And these are holding on pretty well. And you can also kind of see that when we bend it, it really kind of holds its 
holds its shape. And again, it's because the fibers are shrinking more than the stuff underneath, which is the resist in this case. So we are going to release this from the resist and then continue felting it because you're only partially done felting while it's still on the resist. The resist is always gonna hold the fibers at bay to some degree. The next stage of felting is fulling and that's further shrinking the fibers to get them closer and closer together and create a tighter felt. So we will cut this loose and continue agitating and now we're in the fulling stage. Now before we cut this open, you can consider where you want the hole. We do have a video um, called Sampling for Success that I did with my dear friend Don Edwards and we show you a variety of vessels made uh, over a smaller resist but also round uh, and using about half as much fiber. And we show you what happens when you cut the hole in different places. This uh, came out very much looking like a planet, uh, which I love. And so now we just have to decide where you want to put the hole. You could cut a hole right here and make your vessel a little more tall. You could put the hole right in the middle and it'll be a little more uh, round. You just probably want to avoid where the fabric is because we do need to felt whatever area that we cut. We need to felt those edges. So think about where you want to put your hole. One final warning though, any hole you cut is going to expand to some degree. So make it at least a little bit smaller than you plan on the final hole being. I'm going to put the hole right here in the middle. I'm using this little a lid from uh, just a little plastic container I have. And I'm gonna put the hole just right about there. That feels like the middle. A word of caution, I have my Angelina here. It's going to be hairy and I'm going to have to trim it away uh, when we get the hole there. But all I'm going to do is get a nice little mark going with my lid and we'll cut that away. Use your sharpest scissors for this part and just get through all the layers of fiber first until you get to the resist. So stay in one place until you get all the way down to the resist. There, I'm through. And then if you lost your line, just mark it one more time. We have cut away our our hole. This is where we're going to take our resist out and right here you can see our two beautifully even layers, our lighter layer and our dark layer. But before we move the resist, we want to do what's called healing that cut there. And what we see, just like you see here, um, all of the fibers are, are blunt and this would just separate. Now felt naturally does not fray, but this could be picked apart. So by healing or felting the edges, we'll take what is a blunt, a very blunt edge, and we'll make these edges taper together. We're going to do that right here. To heal a cut edge and get all of those fibers bound together nicely, add a little bit of water, get your soap in the mix, just put it on your hands, and rub that edge while it's still on the resist. Now is the time to heal it and it will also prevent it from stretching too much as you continue to work with it. You see that as we agitate, what was a blunt edge now becomes tapered and that is called healing the cut. Once you've rubbed just down by pressing it onto the resist, get your fingers underneath and rub the edge through your fingers and thumb just like this so that you're also felting right inside that rim. You'll find this goes much more quickly on your fine fibers. Your coarse fibers might be a little more pesky, but be patient, it will be worth the while and it's gonna help hold the shape of that cut or hole that you made uh, so that it keeps it looking beautiful. Now we can remove our resist. When we're wet felting, we always talk about shrinkage and we always calculate shrinkage from a starting size to a finish size. In this case, we've wet felted over resist and we've made a felt that's fairly thick. 
When you're calculating your shrinkage, you'll do that after you've completely fold the project, but remember how thick the walls of your piece are? You need to deduct that to calculate your true shrinkage. So you'd want to measure from the inside of the vessel, and that can be difficult, but you can just estimate the thickness of your piece, multiply it by two because that is the thickness of the side walls of your vessel. Now that our vessel is off the resist, we can decide what shape we want it to be. If we want it to be more oblong, we can uh, start shaping it this way uh, and felting it this way so that it uh, gets a little more narrow. But no matter what shape you want it to be, we want to kind of remove what has become a trained edge from sitting flat all this time. So do the best you can and get your hands inside your vessel. You can even reshape it and flatten it. And we're going to do some rubbing and agitation along that equator, if you will, and change it up. Now we are moving on to the stage called fulling. Fulling is like the last stage of the felting process where we get the fibers to shrink even closer together and help form a nice tight felt. I'm going to start manipulating this so that we remove this trained edge that we achieved from our shape being flat. If you want to keep it, you can, but you can also remove it with pressure, rolling, and rubbing. This is a really important stage and it's like rubbing all around the outside. I always feel like helps me burnish the outside. If you feel like you're rubbing along the outside and you're roughing up the fibers, even with your hand well soaked, then your project probably is not felted enough. So go back to the rolling stage, even though you've cut it open. Just keep in mind that anything you do here is gonna to continue to impact the shape of the vessel and the size of the vessel. So be mindful to treat each side evenly if you want to maintain a uniform shape. Fulling is a process of further agitating the felt. You can do this with rolling, you can do it with padding, you can do it with stretching, you can do it with shaping it different ways. You can put your hand inside of the vessel and rub. You can use some wooden tools if you have them. We're just doing anything we can to further tighten that felt and get the fibers closer together. You can kind of start to see how our little vessel is shaping up. It's looking quite like a pot, which I am very fond of. Just thrown pottery in general, very fond of. But we can really shape this a few different ways. Before we do, I want you to see how it shrunk compared to the resist. And we could try and keep going, but I'm very happy with what feels like a nice solid felt. It feels like a great piece of fabric. Um, everything feels like it's holding in place. But if we look at this compared to our resist, we've shrunk pretty well um, because again, inside it only goes to about right here and the same on the other side, only to about right here. But the thing to keep in mind is the more fiber you put in a piece of real estate, the less shrinkage this way you're going to get. What you're getting is a lot of shrinkage this way. So we started with a big pile of fiber and we're asking it to all occupy a shared piece of real estate. It's only going to get so small in circumference, but what we've done is we've mashed everything down together and you can see what a nice thick fabric we've created by bringing all those fibers together into this little area of real estate. So it will seem like you're getting less shrinkage when you have more fibers in the same place because you're making something thicker. And now we're ready for what's called the blocking stage, which is, the, you know, we're going to do a rinse, rinse out all of the soap and water, and we're going to do a final shaping and finishing. If you're not sure about your vessel, whether it's done, then you could rinse it out and let it sit overnight and check the doneness by pulling and tugging at the felt and see how stretchy it is or how much it really holds its shape or whether the fibers pick apart rinse out all of the soap and you can use room temperature water for that. 
After rinsing all of the soap out of our project, we like to do a little water vinegar bath, submerge your project with a couple of tablespoons of vinegar in it, and let it sit for at least 15 minutes. This will bring the wool back to its normal pH and its normal glorious softness and sheen and help break down any residual soap. Then we'll roll it in a towel to remove any excess water. For many people, this can sometimes be the final step in their process, and that's just to let it sit overnight. But we want to take this vessel from its rough beauty to a beautiful finish, and we're going to do that by a process called blocking. Blocking is where we're going to shape the final part of the vessel and give it a gorgeous finish. You can just shape your vessel around a balloon, and you could do that with air or water and air in a balloon. I've done both. So when I want more of a flat bottom and a bulbous top, I'll put water in the bottom of the balloon or other weights and then inflate it. But we're gonna let this one just get all the way round. Looking at this vessel, I want it to have a really gorgeous finish, and I know already that I'm not gonna be happy in how it looks if I only use a balloon, because the outside is still gonna have a bunch of wrinkles. So I'm going to use my favorite process, and that is overstuffing it with fabrics. I started this process using a couple of hand towels, but I didn't have enough fabrics here at the shop, and I took it home to stuff it with my very favorite cotton quilt squares. And I stuff it, and I stuff it, and I stretch it, and I stuff it. I'll even use a dowel to plunge more fiber in there until you just can't fit any more. This is going to expand the vessel and push the perimeter to its maximum. You can shape it a little bit with all of those fabrics in place and you can set it to dry for a day or two or three until it's completely dry. Before my project is completely dry, I like to go over the exterior with an iron. So if it's still damp, you can just iron through a cloth, but if it's not damp, then use steam setting on your iron. This is going to really smooth down all of the outside. Use a pressing cloth as a barrier between your iron so that you don't dull any of the silks. If you have a heat bondable Angelina, it will also convert that sort of wiry exterior into this beautiful texture and color by melting it to itself. So you might give that a try. I'll leave my vessel for two or three days until it's completely dry because I know all of that fabric shoved in there is going to help it achieve its shape. So notice that you can manipulate the shape with how you place your fabrics inside and how you pound it and press on it as you stuff it. So here's a look at the vessels that came out of this project. This is the fine one that was super overstuffed and finished with a steam press. And I have this little extra uh, thread here, which was a fun surprise. It's the extra bit of ribbon that didn't bind. So I'm probably gonna embellish that with a bead or something. Next, we have a vessel made with the same fibers, but we cut the hole in the top in a different place. And the difference is we did not steam press this one and we did not overstuff it. So you can see all of the wrinkles and the hairiness, you know, of the Angelina and just how lumpy and bumpy everything is. If you let your vessel sit this way and you're not happy with it, you can wet it again and block it how you want it. So to get rid of the wrinkles in the wool, you can just overstretch it, steam it, press it, whatever you need to do. This is our coarse vessel and we cut a larger hole so you saw that we were able to felt inside. Plan for that if you work with the finer fibers. All we did for this one is let it sit to dry overnight on a balloon. The projects dry much faster on a balloon than they do in the fabric, um, but you don't get quite the same stretch. So this is a great midpoint. I'd like to go back and go over this with an iron. I do want to melt the Angelina a little bit, but I love all of the sheen. The fabrics were harder to bind, so that was a fun lesson. And next time I'm gonna show you how to deal with that in a later video. 
Um, but it really is a beautiful vessel all on its own and if you like you can finish it with a nice steam press or even consider adding some other embellishments on the outside. We've really had a lot of fun with this project and wet felting a vessel is such a great place to begin in 3D wet felting or wet felting over resist. So we hope you've had fun too. And hey, when you make a vessel, share it on your social and tag us. We really want to see it. If you're still a little unsure about where to get started, definitely grab the kit, whether you go fine or coarse, and you might check out some of our other wet felting videos, even our wet felting a fire bowl video. I think they'll help you get started and see that there's a lot you can explore and a lot of fun you can have. If you'd like to see more projects that you can make by wet felting over resist, check out this playlist. You can make yourself a hat, you can make yourself a drawstring bag, you can make yourself a pumpkin or pumpkins, you can even make an octopus. Lots of projects for you to check out on this playlist right here. Thanks y'all so much for spending this time with us. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.